It's so great to be with you this morning after missing a couple. Pardon my delinquency, I mean my absence. <laughs> I'm glad to see Larry and Judy here this morning because I want to make an announcement. I don't know that it's been made yet that Larry is stepping aside as an elder. He's going to be Elder Emeritus. And I just want to say uh, from the bottom of my heart, and I've already told Larry this, uh, what a blessing you, both of your ministries have been to this church. And I know you're going to continue ministering, and here you are, uh, but you, you've been a great encouragement to me, a great help to us in so many ways. They have done so much that many of you do know some of it, but you don't know all of it. And um, I remember when I was just a, a young man here, what an encouragement Larry uh, was to me. And he played a very significant role in encouraging me to, um, to be a minister here and, and, and to step up and dive in and, and, and be a part of all this. So um, you wouldn't want applause, but uh, uh, I give you my applause. Thank you so much, Judy. Thank you, uh, Larry. And they're not going anywhere, Lord willing, but, uh, and there'll be another, uh, we'll, we'll announce that again some other time. Um, <clears throat> Luke, uh, chapter one, please, please turn in your Bibles uh, to Luke chapter one. We've got a rather long passage uh, this morning, uh, I've titled this lesson, The Birth of John, the Forerunner, with the exception, if you think about it, with the exception of Mark's gospel, all the gospel writers give some description of the events surrounding the birth of Jesus, but only Luke provides the background to the birth of John the Baptist. We commonly refer to these passages as the birth narratives. Matthew's is uh, comparatively brief. John's consists of one verse, and you know it, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. But Luke sets the stage for both births more fully. Uh, what was it like and what were the events in detail that signaled the long-awaited arrival of God's Messiah into the world, the wonder of all that God performed among his people at the time, and that still fills the hearts of believers with such wonder every Christmas season. The prophets of old had provided markers for a future generation to recognize its imminence. We need only to turn to one, uh, Isaiah 8 and chapter 9, for example, to identify the conditions that would exist at the time and that get, give the context behind Luke chapters 1 and 2. Uh, just before the great chapter 9 of Isaiah, the final verse of chapter 8 describes the spiritual atmosphere among God's people at the time. They will look to the earth, he prophesies, and behold distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish. But then immediately following in chapter 9, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light, uh, those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. We know that verse, and yet we love to hear it read and proclaimed. It's a magnificent verse. There was darkness and God caused light to come into the world. You've been here with all the rain we've 
<laughs> we've had, I haven't, but you have, and what, it's hot, but it's nice to have the sunshine out. Well, this is the ultimate sunshine. The prophet Malachi 2 in Malachi 3 verse 1 recorded God's promise. Behold, I'm going to send my messenger and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come into his temple. Well, here in Luke's gospel, he draws from these prophecies of old and brings their fulfillment to life. Already we've seen Luke has recorded how the births of both John the Baptist and Jesus were foretold by the angel Gabriel. And now Luke chapter 1 concludes with the fulfillment of the one, and of course chapter 2 will bring the fulfillment of the birth of Jesus. And both emphasize how God is faithful to his promises and brings joy to the hearts of his people. But first, the birth of John. It is a sequel of sorts to the scene earlier in the chapter, if you can remember, uh, in verses 5 through 25, in which the miracle birth was promised in the temple between Gabriel and the priest, Zechariah. So we're going to break our reading of this rather long passage into two portions, starting with the birth of John in its own right and the surprising naming of the child, and that followed by Zacharias's Benedictus. So let's read first verses 57 through 66. Now the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth, and she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and her relatives heard that the Lord had displayed his great mercy toward her, and they were rejoicing with her. And it happened that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to call him Zacharias after his father. But his mother answered and said, No, indeed, but he shall be called John. And they said to her, there is no one among your relatives who is called by that name. And they made signs to his father as to what he wanted him called. And he asked for a tablet. Remember, the angel had, or God had struck him deaf and dumb. And so he asked for a tablet. And he wrote as follows, his name is John. And they were all astonished. And at once... His mouth was opened and his tongue loosed and he began to speak in praise of God. Fear came on all those living around them and all these matters were being talked about in all the hill country of Judea. All who heard them kept them in mind saying, what then will this child turn out to be for the hand of the Lord was certainly with them. The birth of a long-awaited child is always the occasion for great joy. I've always said this, I, I really have, and I say it to the young people that I work with, that the births of my three children and all the occasions surrounding them are three of the greatest moments of my life. Of course, it helped that Cindy was actually the one bringing the children <laughs> into the world. Uh, Cindy took that on herself. Maybe she's listening. <laughs> Who knows? But you can imagine the scene surrounding the birth of this miracle child. The impossible had become possible in the first cries of the newborn infant. The parents were simply too old to have conceived and born a child. And besides, the mother, as you remember, had been barren her whole life. Uh, but now he was here. And it was not the grandparents who were cuddling the little baby in their arms, but the aged parents to whom God had shown such, shown such mercy and grace. They were over the top with joy and elation, and their neighbors and kin joined with them. You can imagine the scene. Uh, God had sent a message with this birth. 
First, <clears throat> that he is sovereign and omnipotent and nothing is too difficult for him. But also that his was not a cold, detached exercise of divine power, but it came from a heart of tender sympathy. And Luke recognized that and gave expression to it with that little clause in verse 58 that the Lord had displayed his great mercy toward Elizabeth. Literally, God had magnified his great mercy. It's the same thought and the same expression that came upon Mary in the previous passage when she burst into praise, my soul magnifies the Lord. So the Lord had an interest, not just in the child himself, but in the display of his mercy. And everyone seemed to have acknowledged that. But when it came time to name the child, they were all allowed a special reminder of the Lord's sovereign hand in it. It was customary at the time to give a name to the newborn that drew from the family line, and that was especially true of a firstborn son to, to whom a name was given that matched either the father or the, the grandfather's. And that explains the surprise of those who came for the child's circumcision on the eighth day. Perhaps it was a local custom, uh, but the parents were obviously expected to announce the name of the child on the same day as the child was circumcised. And they all expected uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth to name their son Zacharias. That's clear from the text. But Elizabeth forcefully contradicted them. No, indeed, she said, but he shall be called John. And when they all, you know, butted in and protested and attempted to get Zacharias to, to set things right, well, he asked for this tablet, which must have been his habit over the last nine months of not being able to speak or express himself. And he confirmed the name instead, writing, his name is John. It is John. Uh, the Lord, who had sent the angel to announce the conception of the child in the first place, along with what they were to name him, had given them both the conviction they needed to acquiesce in what the others found remarkable. The Lord, who had shown them such mercy, had now ruled in their hearts, and so it's not surprising then that when at once the Lord loosened Zacharias' tongue, the first words were of praise to God. He burst forth with it. He couldn't suppress it. After nine months of frustration and, and this nervous anticipation, you can imagine, he could only sing God's praises. And the effect on those surrounding them who had not been in on this special background had their own electric feeling of awe at what they had witnessed. Who is this child, they wondered. Uh, the baby's birth would prove to be only the beginning of the greatest witness to the saving power of God to the world that the world has ever seen. So there's that, and in the remaining verses of Luke's chapter 1, we're treated to another of the signature songs of prophecy and praise Luke included in his gospel. Uh, the first, you remember, let's count them off, was Elizabeth's reaction when Mary came to her house, a very brief expression of praise, but quite eloquent. Uh, that was followed by Mary's Magnificat, so named for the Latin translation of the opening words. And in chapter 2, we will read the devout Simeon's Nunc Dimittis. But well, first we come now to Zacharias' Benedictus. Uh, again, uh, called that because of the Latin translation of the opening line in verse 68 blessed, benedictus, blessed be the Lord God of Israel. 
So let's read it now, and you'll see perhaps if you have an outline that it consists of two main ideas. The first is his praise for the deliverer God has sent, and it's not his own newborn child. But then the second expression of praise is for the role John will play in supporting the promised Savior. His song is both prophecy and an expression of joy, but his joy significantly is first revealed as a reaction to the news of the child that Mary will soon bear, and only then for his own son. So the the one must have preeminence above the other. And so we observe that Zacharias' prophecy foreshadows what the history of the two will bear out. One must increase, the other must decrease. And so filled with the Holy Spirit, Zacharias uh, gives us what Kent Hughes called the final song before the sunrise. So his, verse 67, his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied saying, blessed be the God of Israel, the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, his servant, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy toward our fathers and remember his holy covenant the oath which he swore to Abraham, our father, to grant us that we, being rescued from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give to his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God with which the sunrise from on high will visit us. To shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child continued to grow and to become strong in spirit. And he lived in the deserts until the day of his public appearance in Israel. I'm going to have to start wearing glasses. <laughs> back, to, back to glasses, but I made it through that. Well, uh, we'll say more in the studies to come about that little historical footnote at the end. Uh, it's Luke's signature that he is indeed a historian. But here in the Benedictus is pure joy expressed. We too seldom really know what pure joy is, but here is pure joy. Uh, first, for the arrival of the preeminent one, and then for the son who is given the privilege of going before him to prepare his way. Uh, so Zacharias puts in song and prophecy what history would bear out. But the expression of elation that first sounds forth from his tongue is for the coming of the promised deliverer pictured as the long-awaited messianic sunrise. And so Zacharias cries out, praise to the Lord God of Israel. Uh, what was then occurring and, and was soon to happen was rooted in the history of the Lord God with his chosen people. Uh, marvelous promises had been made. Uh, through the mouths of the prophets and others and faithful Israel had fitfully anticipated their fulfillment. Now the moment had finally come. Zacharias knew it, and, and now he recites the content of those promises. What were they? Uh, 
Well, the first was that God would one day visit his people and accomplish redemption for them. It was to be no casual visit. We do a lot of visiting with each other, but this was to be no casual visit as we might interpret our visits. Uh, the verb translated visited is used in other places of, of God's visiting his people in the sense of coming to bless and to save them. And that was the essence of the divine visitation. And you'll notice if you look down in verse 78, uh, God's visit is the same as the Messiah's visit. It is the same as the Lord Jesus Christ's visit to our world. The sunrise from on high will visit us. So God visits us, the sun visits us. They are the same visitation. Now Jesus had not yet been born, but notice this, the, the flow of the passage. Zechariah has received the promises and considers them to be as good as accomplished. The first step of a chain of events already fulfilled in the birth of his, his own son, and every aspect of the promised deliverance as certain as though it had already occurred. We see this in the Bible all the time. But the reader of Zacharias's song can never understand the foundation of his joy without coming to bear first with the sickness that precipitated it. The faithful of Israel, like Zacharias and Elizabeth and Mary and Joseph, lived their lives under a burden, uh, the, 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 the burden of the sickness of sin. There, theirs was not a simply a physical, political delivery that they longed for primarily, but a rescue from their sinful condition. It's ironic if you think about it, and really, and really sad that these passages of Scripture that occupy us in our study are recited uh, perhaps more than any other in the celebrations at Christmas time, and yet they're so often blindly uttered without a thought to the disease for which the Christ child had come into the world to cure. And that's the absolute truth. We see it every year. Cindy and I uh, were watching the um, French Open uh, the other night. Cindy likes tennis, and I like it too, if one of the superstars are, are playing. And uh, this, t this night, it was Nadal, Rafael Nadal. Not the match he lost, <laughs> but the one, uh, the other one. And, uh, but it was his opponent who, who caught our attention. Perhaps you were watching. Uh, the unfortunately named Yannick Sinner. You heard me right, Sinner is, is his name. He's an Italian professional tennis player. And so we were sitting around and we had a lot of fun with the observations the commentators were making uh, about the match. Sinner needs to pick up his game. <laughs> oh no, Sinner's in a lot of trouble here. If he doesn't get back on pace, Sinner's going to lose. <laughs> well, the reality is, of course, uh, we all bear, if not the actual name, at least the eponym, uh, Sinner. It was to save sinners that God sent his son into the world and John the Baptist uh, before him to prepare the way by actually preaching on sin and the need for repentance and forgiveness. That was the spiritual reality that was behind Zacharias's joyful ode to the coming Savior. The nature of his visit is explained by two key words in Zacharias's song in verses 68 and 69, redemption and salvation. The two are related, of course. Uh, the one is the means to the other. 
You're no stranger to the term redemption. You've heard it defined from this pulpit time and, 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 and time again. A similar term is ransom, but it can be used both in a, a physical, earthly sense, you know, of ransoming someone from slavery, and a spiritual sense. And the people gathered around Zacharias and Elizabeth at John's circumcision ceremony were united, along with all believing Israel, in the legacy of God's having redeemed them as a nation in the exodus from Egypt. Uh, that was a fundamental underpinning of their existence as a nation, as the people of God. He had shown his special care for them by saving them, redeeming them from their captivity in Egypt. But that was only a symbol. It was real. The exodus from Egypt was real, but it was only a symbol of a much greater ransom. The ransom from their slavery to sin that revealed itself in every generation. And the visit Zacharias celebrated was that of a savior from God who would purchase his people out of their slavery to sin. God had raised up a horn, notice, he had raised up a horn of salvation for us. That's what Zechariah says. In the house of David, his servant. And that is another common figure of speech we find often in the utterances of Old Testament figures, the horn of salvation. Uh, they lived in a largely rural uh, world, and the horn of an animal represented its strength and power. If you've spent time in the country or in the wild, or if you're a hunter, then you have seen a, a steer or a bull or a deer or an elk uh, strut his stuff, so to speak, by whirling and gesticulating its horns at another competing animal in hopes of asserting his power. It's quite the sight to see out in the wild. In one of David's Psalms, Psalm 18, he transfers the figure to the almighty strength of the Lord. He celebrates it. He says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord and I am saved from my enemies. Now here Zacharias draws from that figure you see in verse 69, but notice he ties it, this is important, he ties it directly to the Davidic covenant that God had made with David. God has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, his servant. Another psalm, Psalm 132, is even more explicit. In verse 17 of Psalm 132, when God himself speaks, I will cause the horn of David to spring forth. I have prepared a lamp for mine anointed, his enemies I will clothe with shame, but upon himself his crown shall shine. Zach, now listen, Zacharias' newborn son that he was so excited about and that he and his wife were so proud of was not descended from the house of David, but Messiah was his praise to God is for Jesus, the powerful deliverer that his praise for his own son he reserved for later. But here is the great celebration. Uh, Zacharias has had nine months to think about it, and he has comprehended it. Blessed be the God of Israel, he has done it in fulfillment of his promise. He has visited us and raised up that horn of salvation for us in the long-awaited Son 
of David. But like so many, as events would eventually unfold, Zacharias would not have foreseen, he could not have foreseen the ultimate rejection of Messiah that yet awaited him. Uh, Luke will record it in his 19th chapter, the 19th chapter of our Gospel of Luke, where Jesus approaches, you remember this scene, Jesus approaches Jerusalem in the last days, and he weeps over it and predicts judgment upon the city and the nation because, he says, you did not recognize the time of your visitation. You did not recognize it. But Zacharias continues in verses 70 and following by recognizing that what God has begun to do is what he has promised through the prophets. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. The prophets of old had actually predicted what was now unfolding, that the seed of David would come and destroy their enemies and, and bring salvation to God's people. Not that any one of those prophets had painted the picture comprehensively, only in bits and pieces and in foreshadowings and, and figures. We spend a lot of time studying them, don't we? To bring them all together to get a fuller picture. Uh, that is what the risen Christ would later lament uh, to the two disciples on the road uh, to Emmaus. They were slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And Zacharias, though, here seems to be compiling them all himself <laughs> into one collage of meaning, all hinging, it seems, on that most fundamental covenant, the most fundamental covenant, the, the one even upon which David's covenant relied, the covenant God had made with Abraham of ultimate rescue in the form of a people of God and a kingdom of God whose inhabitants would live in total security without fear, as he goes on to say. Uh, the child who was to be born of Mary, the sunrise from on high, would be the epitome of God's mercy. And that's verse 72 of his faithfulness to every promise he had ever made. And I would just say, by way of application, uh, that that ought to give great encouragement to each of us. The, the same God of Zacharias and of Abraham and David is our God. And he never changes. He's always the same. He is as faithful to us as he promised to be faithful to them. And the fears uh, Zacharias announced God would dispel in verse 74, are, are the same fears, they're the same fears that creep in up, upon us. So we too can trust in his promises and we can rest in them. We can rest in those promises and go on to serve him, to serve the Lord, secure in the knowledge that God has promised. He causes all things to work together for good for those who love him, for those who are the called according to his purpose. And that verse, which we all know, Romans 8, 28, serves as a good transition to verses 74 and 75. Uh, God has a purpose. He has a purpose in his saving and redeeming work in our lives. God had remembered his covenant and extended mercy, Zacharias says, so as to grant us that we, being rescued from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Zacharias had no thought of a liberation that resembled some kind of libertinism and self-indulgence. Uh, what happens to a believer, inevitably, when their heart is changed, our heart is changed, 
is there arises a desire in us to respond to that deliverance by seeking to serve the one who delivered us. And the Apostle Paul would later write that we were once slaves to sin, but now we're slaves to Christ, willingly serving him as our benevolent master who has dealt with us in such a marvelous way. In Zacharias' song, I, I want you to consider this. We hear echoes of the very theological declaration of Paul in Ephesians 1, verse 4, that God chose us, election, that God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world with a purpose, that we should be holy and blameless before him. There is purpose in what he says, in God's having elected us. And a kind of joyful service to him is a hallmark of the lives of the truly elect, of those who've been rescued by him. We want to serve him. We want to live lives of holiness and obedience and devotion and worship. But then Luke records in verse 76 how Zacharias' prophecy now shifts to a focus on his own newborn son. And you, child, he begins. I love that. And you, child, his own, his own child. We don't know for certain from these inspired words, certainly on paper, uh, the emotion that he felt at this moment, but we can imagine something of his more personal involvement at this point as the truths that he has just proclaimed find their intersection with his own miraculous flesh and blood. Uh, not only was he the son born from impossibility, but he had been given to the world. His son had been given to the world for the most wonderful, devoted uh, ministry to be God's own prophet. There had not been a prophet for 400 years. What a what a gift, what a feeling. It must have been overwhelming to him. But his prophetic ministry would be especially significant because he would go before the Lord to prepare his ways. That phrase there is something of a combination of Isaiah 40, verse 3. Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness, make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. And the verse I mentioned earlier, Malachi 3, verse 1, Behold, I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. And here even is how he would prepare the way. It would be by revealing to the people of Israel where salvation might be found. It would be found in the forgiveness of their sins. The two were intrinsically connected, salvation and forgiveness, and John would be the great facilitator, not by offering it to the people himself, but by pointing them to the sunrise from on high who would visit them soon in order to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death and to, to guide their feet into the way of peace. And so we've come full circle. The spiritual darkness that pervaded uh, the Jewish nation, uh, their captivity under a, a harsh pagan Roman rule was now to be penetrated, as Isaiah had predicted, by this child to be born to them, this son uh, to be given to them. And peace, blessed peace, as Zacharias ends this song of joy, will be the end result. As Isaiah had written, there would be no end to the increase of his government or of peace.
Well, that is in fact what did happen, we know. God is a promise keeper. He was the original. He has, is the original promise keeper. The seeming defeat of Jesus Christ on the cross at the direction of the Jewish leaders and executed by Roman authority was in fact the path to peace. It was the necessary ransom paid in order to truly set his people free as he bore our sins upon himself and satisfied God's justice upon our sin. He took our sin upon himself. We received the forgiveness of sins and the righteousness of God imputed to us. This is what we'll be remembering today in the Lord's Supper. The horn of salvation, the mighty horn, the Davidic Savior roared in his passion and defeated our greatest foe, Satan. The gospel is the horn of salvation and it is powerful enough to save. Is he your savior? Have you received his forgiveness and salvation from your sins? Was your name sinner? But now it's peace and joy and forgiven. And are you serving him uh, without fear, but in the peace that only comes from him? I hope you are. That's our prayer, of course, for all who are listening today. I look out on this group, and I know uh, you are. And we give thanks for that. What a what a a thing to rejoice at, to have a room full of people who love this and know it to be true and have buried it deep in their hearts by the power of God. Father, thank you for being our horn of salvation. Uh, thank you for the way you entered into our world. Uh, you broke into the time and space and history and you miraculously brought a son to a couple who, they couldn't have a son. You miraculously brought uh, the God-man into the world through a virgin. And the one prepared the way for the other. Uh, we look forward to continuing our study. Thank you for loving us and seeking us out. We pray in Jesus' name.